the experiential piece of education. You just can't do that virtually. So uh, we had to make the really difficult decision, although now it seems like the clear one, to bring home 52 students who were away at Alexander Musk for the semester in Israel. All of our experiential programs at every grade level got canceled, and we feel that those programs are a huge part of the educational experience for our kids. So the entire year builds up to the 11th grade civil rights trip, both in Judaic studies and in US history, and those kids will not go on that experience, obviously. So those pieces you just can't simulate, and we really haven't tried. We are trying to some extent to create a Shabbat atmosphere and do an Oneg virtually, where kids can log into different Oneg experiences. But even that, I would say, is challenging. So that's on the educational front. The, the social emotional piece has been huge. Um, and I would say thematically, the, the two pieces, both for, for kids, parents, and really for faculty, are navigating, um, uh, navigating and managing disappointment. So even though in the grand scheme of what's going on in the world, missing your high school graduation or your high school prom is not that significant, for the child living through it, it feels very significant. So for our seniors who have spent the last six years looking forward to the second semester of their senior year, it, it really is loss. They are mourning the loss of their senior year. And to help them through that and to help their families through that has been a major challenge. And then I think the second piece, both for Milken and for all of our schools, is just about navigating the unknown. You know, if we knew we would be back in school in the middle of May, we could plan pretty effectively for that. If we knew what the summer would look like, we could plan for that, but we really don't know. And we don't know both in terms of what school will look like, and we certainly don't know in terms of what the financial picture will look like. So that's probably the third piece of, um, you know, what being ahead right now, we're spending the majority of our time trying to really predict and plan for the unpredictable. So we all had budgets going into January and February that many of our schools have now completely redone, um, Milken included, to both prepare for recession and just the um, unknown economic and emotional impact on families when they have to sign on the dotted line for those tuitions. So we're seeing that play out in lots and lots of different ways, some with our own families who are already receiving aid, some with families that have never received aid, and certainly for the families in particular coming into seventh grade who are signing for the first time. Um, the silver lining of all of that is that I've never in my professional career in LA experienced a more collaborative time for the heads of schools of Jewish schools. So um, in particular, just thinking about my colleagues, Mark Schball and Rabbi Siegel, Mark at Toledo and Rabbi Siegel at Shell Hevet, we are in touch multiple times a day, it feels like, really thinking creatively in ways that we never have. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, the financial impact will definitely be more seriously felt at the K-8 level, uh, where there was already, uh, where very honestly schools were already running a financial model that was completely unsustainable. Um, and that was in a good economy. And now that that has turned, I think it leaves a lot of questions open for what future viability, especially of so many different schools in the Los Angeles area looks like. And I imagine that's being replicated across the country. Um, there's also been a great collaboration both with Jewish day schools and our colleagues at independent schools. So again, there's a call with the CAIS Association almost every day. Prisma has been an incredible resource for day school heads, both on the educational front and the financial one, running a bunch of different webinars on different topics to support its professionals. Um, so those are, the, those are the good pieces of it. We've never seen so much collaboration. Um, and then there are lots of really beautiful stories, like our robotics team writing to the leader of the Garen um, Fab Lab at Milken, talking about creating prototyping masks for hospital workers and working with our director of our Fab Lab and Cedar sinai to get masks in the hands of really needed doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals. So I, th I think that the idea of kids really being able to take knowledge that they've used and do something good in the moment has been really inspiring for us all. Um, and there are many more stories like that. Um, 
but that's sort of the, I would say that that's a, a, a 30,000 foot view of what's going on in day schools right now. And um, it's definitely a time, it feels like a time of crisis that we're all having to navigate the community through together. Sarah, thank you for that perspective. We know that it's not simple and we thank you for your leadership during this time. We're gonna pass the mic over now uh, to Wendy Newberger. Again, Wendy is the Director of Jewish and Israel Giving at Crown Family Philanthropies. And Wendy will give us a little bit of a perspective on what's emerged or, or is emerging for funders. Wendy, over to you. First of all, I just want to say I hope everybody and your families are doing well and adjusted to home life and that people are healthy. Um, and I also want to give a huge shout out to the educators and the um, educational leadership that are on this call and across the country. Um, Sarah hit on a lot of this, but it is unparalleled challenges and unparalleled times. And universally as a whole and a collective, it just feels like we've risen to the occasion. And um, to our teachers that are struggling to have their own kids at home and still maintain this incredible innovative new space, and to the leadership who is working around the clock to help support those teachers, I just say kola kavod. And we all, on behalf of everybody, really appreciate that. And a little also chime out for board members who are being asked to do things that they never thought they'd ever have to do and to have to understand things they never thought they'd have to understand and have definitely signed on for something they, they weren't anticipating. They are also, I, in a lot of cases, just rising to the occasion. And um, I, we should all be grateful. And, and Sarah hit on it. This space of collaboration is just exponentially growing right now, and it feels great. Um, so in terms of what's happening here in Chicago and from a funder's perspective, um, we, we are lucky that we collaborate with the other peer funders in our community and we kind of agreed we didn't want to be inundating all of our grantees and calling everybody and saying, how are you doing? What are your needs? Um, so we were in the process of figuring out a way to field a survey and um, wound up collaborating with our federation. So if you want to talk about great collaboration here in Chicago, I feel like um, the funders in our federation are, are, have never been more in sync than they are right now. We fielded a collective survey that went to all um, Jewish organizations, whether they were grantees of our our federation or ours or not, we wanted to get a sense of the field and what was going on in the short term. And short term, we, de we defined as most immediate, meaning right now, and the short term of up till June 30. And um, as you can imagine, there are some agencies that are in dire needs right now in this moment if they're going to continue. And then there, and then it tears out from there. So in terms of what we're seeing in the day school world, um, the first and foremost, and I'm sure this won't surprise anybody, but that some of our schools that were struggling ahead of time continue to have those struggles. Um, frankly, they're not any worse than they were in February. They still exist, but the prospect of what happens next is really scary for anyone who walked into this with already a financially challenged model. The rest of our schools are experiencing much what Sarah said from an educational standpoint. Um, they haven't missed a beat. Um, same issues about the younger kids, the older kids, whatever. I would say the ma vast majority of our schools have moved on to online. There are a few that haven't been able to because their community maybe doesn't have the resources or the setup to, to allow for in-home learning. Um, probably the most severely impacted service is in fact our academic tutoring and our academic supports, um, whether they're in the classroom or social emotional um, support, it's just not able to happen in this context. Um, kids that were used to being um, in small groups or one-on-one -on -one aren't gonna get that opportunity right now and that's very challenging for all the schools. Um, in terms of the financial impact that we're seeing, um, like I said, we kind of looked at it in the immediate term and the longer term and we asked organizations and day schools whether they thought they could cover their costs between now and April 30 and then from now until June 30. Um, the majority of our schools, probably more than 60%, felt that they'd be fine from here until the end of April. Um, about a quarter of them said, no, we probably, we're gonna even struggle to get through April based on fundraising and rescinded da 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 and people wanting tuitions back. Um, but when we start looking at the end of June, the picture gets pretty bad. Um, only about 8% of the schools were confident that they could make it um, through to June without struggling. Um, and 45% just said, no, we probably, we can't. I mean, by June, we will start needing relief and help. 
Um, the concerns for this current year uh, center around those schools that hadn't had tuition that had been completed yet. You know, many, many schools by March 30, the tuition for the current school year is done and paid for. There are cases where it's an extended pay period and they're doubtful that they will get or realize those tuitions that haven't been fully paid for yet. Um, there are a small number of people asking for refunds, but not many. But that is an issue for some schools. And um, annual campaigns aren't finished yet. And in most cases, they're, they're, they've got a big gap still to go. Some, some schools cited they still had their annual, their annual fundraiser, and that would be a big hit for them not to be able to have it. And I'm sad to say that in some cases, people are already citing rescinded gifts and that people are not, are not going to make good on their pledges. So uh, there are holes being created right now. Um, and when we start looking ahead to next year, I, you know, Sarah noted some of them already. Um, there's across the board, there's a huge concern with the rising need for financial aid and how that will be able to be bridged. Um, fundraising is a big concern that already if parents are asking for more help, then you know, where, where's the fundraising going to come from? Um, our schools that, uh, for which enrollment is not a given, they're very concerned about re-enrollment and new enrollments, um, and as, as they should be, I guess. Um, although, anecdotally, at least here in Chicago, the, the uh, amazing product that has been online in our Jewish community has become like, you know, it's like the talk of the town, if you will. It's the talk of Facebook, for sure. Um, I will say that uh, if schools don't open in September, there's conversation about consolidation and where staff might need to be cut and how that would look. Um, I do want to say that I have to always find those silver linings, and there are two. And one of them is that I have found it surprising that many of the schools are not reporting that people are requesting their deposits back for next year. Um, and this would be the time I would think parents would get the spilkies of, I don't want to commit. Um, some of our schools have already had the deadline by which it's not refundable, and if not, it's coming up very shortly. And really, that hasn't happened, so that, that's a, a peak of a good news. Um, the other thing is, we even know of a school that picked up two families of enrollment in this period of time, because when compared to what's going on in the public schools, the family said, I, I can't bear this, and uh, the schools wouldn't accept them unless they agreed that, yes, I'm signing one for next year too, and we picked up some families. So potentially, if this is a long-term problem, we maybe, see, we maybe will see some benefit to that, how we'll pay for it, I don't know. Um, uh, I will say in terms of what, as a funder, even before this happened, um, at least here at Crown Family Philanthropies, we've really acknowledged that the sustainability issue is a big one in the day school world. And we were really like, this was one of our things, hey, let's roll up our sleeves and start tackling it. And then voila, COVID-19. And I kind of am looking at that as a silver lining too, because I think this is our opportunity to readjust and, 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 and figure things out and move forward in a different way across the board. I think in order to do that, there's gonna be a lot of sharing that needs to happen. Um, there are some models out there that are currently working that I was in the middle of kind of learning about and those need to be public and we need to test them and share them together. And we need to collaborate to figure out some of those solutions. Um, I also think there's gonna be a delicate um, balance that's not gonna to need to be created between, don't get mad at me, but quality versus access. And in a lot of cases, our quality is at a really great place right now. And we might have to recognize that it's time to kind of assess how much more to invest in the quality versus, versus creating access for families to continue to be a part of the day school community. I think the only way to do that is to come up with some shared measures that we all kind of agree are a really gold standard and, and good enough to go by. Um, and that will take some collaboration there as well. So um, I guess for now I'll pause because we have some chance for conversation after this, but that's from a funder's perspective, I think an opportunity for collaboration across schools and funders and federations and, um, and a reimagining of what our financial models maybe could look like moving forward. Beautiful, Wendy. Thank you for the optimism with which uh, you shared all of that. We're going to transition now over to Dan Perla. Dan, uh, again, is the Senior Director of Catalyzing Resources at Prisma. And Dan will give us a financial overview 
of what we're seeing about current financial trends in the field. Dan? Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Tamar. If um, I've been having some connectivity issues here, so if uh, I may go off video at some point, which will make it easier to uh, hear me, if not see me. Um, so I want to echo some of the comments that Wendy and Sarah, uh, the smaller schools are struggling. Schools that were already struggling with enrollment um, are very concerned about enrollment in the upcoming year. Stronger, more stable, larger schools um, are less concerned. Um, the short-term needs, again, more acute for schools, for smaller schools that have struggled with enrollment um, and less concerns among more uh, larger and more stable schools in the short term. Um, as Wendy and Sarah both said, the many schools have done the bulk of their tuition collecting for this year. Some have done the bulk of their fundraising. Um, that's, um, and, and for some, for some, but a minority, that remains an acute issue. The bigger issue for everyone is really the lack of visibility in terms of next year. Um, and uh, we've been having discussions with schools and communities all over the country, trying to model out, take a, a first cut at what scholarship might look like for next year. We've put out a preliminary number of a $200 million plus gap um, in, in funding. That is to say, if scholarship system-wide among 300 day schools right now, represents about $500 million. We anticipate that going to approximately $700 million next year. And that's a function uh, of both lower enrollment, particularly in non-Orthodox day schools, and more importantly, a very significant increase in scholarship. Um, I was struck, Wendy, by some of your comments around um, affordability and, and, and tuitions because one of the things that we think is, uh, we're seeing signs is already emerging and we think will accelerate is this view of um, regional and national models of scholarship, middle income and alternative tuition models. Um, we think that's gonna become, um, we think that's gonna become rise to the, rise to be first and foremost on schools and funders um, agenda for, uh, for tackling some of this. Um, I'll also say, um, and both of you alluded to it, that we are anticipating a consolidation. We were already starting to do work in various communities around mergers and, and consolidation within the day school field. And we think that's a trend that, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, this crisis is going to accelerate. Um, we're already starting to get some of those calls, though it feels like it's still a bit early. And there's so many things we know uh, involved. There's so many uh, variables that need to come together for schools, groups of schools, or uh, communities to, um, to show up at the table eager um, and willing to, to engage in that discussion. So that's another area. Um, lastly, just to put a, maybe end on a, a slightly positive note in terms of the school picture, we are hearing from schools, from a number of schools that they have the perception among pri public school parents is that they've done such an outstanding job rising to the challenges um, both through their ability to go virtual so quickly and to keep the quality of the content so high and engagement with children so high that there were actually parents inquiring about Jewish day schools for their children. In some cases, I've heard parents are enrolling their kids now, but in most cases, they're inquiring about next year. So as much as we're thinking about the possibility of a 5% or more enrollment decline um, in, within the system, that might be mitigated to a large extent by a new population of parents who are really, really impressed with what they're seeing in, in our day school, uh, in our day schools. Um, let me just spend a couple of minutes on some um, sing things that are going, uh, going on in, in the funding community. Number one, um, we know that there are a number of foundations that are looking at some significant assistance to Jewish organizations. Uh, for instance, the Grinspoon Foundation offered a t um, just announced a $10 million program for many of their camps. We know there are funders looking at day schools and JCCs. These funders are thinking expansively and inclusively and understand that there's, uh, there's a need for some short-term and some probably some longer-term financial assistance. Um, we've begun exploring a national uh, interest-free loan program with some of the various uh, Hebrew free loans across the country. Um, and um, we're hoping to have more details around that um, shortly. And um, we've, PRISMA has been working very closely with JFNA and of course with JFN 
uh, to really disseminate as much information as we can and to make sure um, that, that we're collaborating with as many organizations as we possibly can for the good of our day schools. Um, lastly, let me just spend one more minute commenting on the payroll protection program. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, because there've been many webinars on it, that program launched um, on Friday. Uh, and notwithstanding all the difficulties of accessing those funds, and notwithstanding the ambiguity around the terms of that um, uh, government program, um, it's our sense that many, many schools, probably the majority, if not the overwhelming majority, have or will shortly apply for those funds. And fingers crossed, uh, we're hoping that many will be approved and that this will, uh, and that the majority of these loans will ultimately, ultimately be forgiven which will um, essentially provide two months or close to two months worth, close to two months worth of payroll for many of these schools. Um, so in terms of short term, that will, that will make, that will help. That will help them get through this summer. Um, again, both Wendy and Sarah alluded to longer term issues uh, and still a lack of clarity as to what the 2021 school year pretends. Um, but as the weeks go by, we'll have more clarity around that and we'll obviously be here to help and support uh, the day schools in any way we can. Let me pause there and turn it back over to Deborah. Thanks, Dan. Um, so some questions for the three of you. If you were to ask funders to invest in three key areas in order to ease the burden that you anticipate coming down the pike, what would those three key areas be? Wendy, maybe we'll start with you if you feel comfortable jumping in on this. And then, Sarah, if you want to take it after that. Three key areas that you would see funders um, interested in funding in right now? Yeah, in order to alleviate some of the burden that, that, we that we're currently seeing and that we anticipate coming down the pike. Yeah. Um, I would say that the um, ability to create give any technical support that's necessary to help bridge this time would be something that funders hopefully will be interested in doing. So the things, whether it's labor law or um, anything that helps to bridge this time to get an organization, particularly a school, to a safer space is something I think that um, funders would be interested in helping to do. Um, the other thing is to have the least disruption of people's lives. And by that, I don't just mean the students and the families, but the staff as well. Um, that might mean a little pinching in here and there, but any way that we could help support that bridge is really important. And I guess the last piece is to, to still be investing in figuring out the future model of all of this and even if it if it requires some consolidation and pivoting now in order to get there i don't i don't think we should take the eye off the long-term needs of this sector um, if we're going to get through it thanks wendy sarah any thoughts so um what wendy said initially and just sort of repeated really resonated with me because i think in a lot of ways this is a golden opportunity because it gives the real impetus for the kinds of collaboration that probably needed to happen for the last decade. So, and I think it even opens up more possibilities now that we know what can exist in a digital space, in a virtual space. But I think, you know, other than the obvious answer, which would be endowment and tuition assistance, because I think that those are the two, you know, two of the areas that are, that are related, obviously, that are gonna carry schools both today and into the future. I think one thing that funders could be thinking about is how to incentivize collaboration and even consolidation of the day schools. Because at least as far as the Los Angeles landscape goes, we are running a really inefficient, illogical system with lots of um, barriers to the kinds of collaboration that I think really need to happen. And I think if there was a, uh, if there were some financial incentives for more creative, more ambitious thinking, I think that that would really help sort of jumpstart what, what already really needs to happen. Um, indirect way of answering. Thank you, Sarah. Interesting. By the so, way, I, I don't want to dismiss endowment as a really important thing, but I feel like that's going to take a while to get organizations to a place where that will be a meaningful 
uh, it is a long, long-term solution, but I do think endowment is a really important thing for uh, us to be thinking about, right? Yeah. Thanks for that clarification, Monday. Um, so as you think about these potential collaborations um, that both of you spoke about, and Dan, please feel free to jump in on this. What do you think still needs to be learned, or, or what gaps need to be filled in order to move in that direction? I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll, I'll maybe sharpen the question a little bit. That is to say, what information um, going forward, financial information would be would be helpful um, in in getting to in help in moving towards solutions. In other words. Do we need to wait for the final uh, the final assessment of what financial aid looks like? Do we need to wait for um, final enrollment numbers for next year? Or are there steps that we could be taking now as a field or in, in, your, in Chicago and in LA respectively um, to, to move that discussion along? Sarah sort of alluded to, um, to the LA landscape. But my, my question is, what do we need to wait for in terms of fact? And what, what, what do we know enough of now to move forward? What we, what we need to learn is more on the effective side than the technical side. So we knew going into this crisis that the rates at which we were giving out tuition assistance, and, and this is speaking for Los Angeles, but I know it's true nationwide, were not sustainable in the long term. And there was a lot of magical thinking around, oh, if we just marketed better, or if we just did X, Y, and Z better, that we would be in a more financially stable position. As Wendy said, you know, endowment is good, but it takes years for that to pay off unless you're talking about really big numbers. And I think, you know, funders have sort of looked in and seen all of these schools struggling and wondered, should they invest if the model is not going to be sustainable in the long term? So I think that information we actually knew going into this, mm -hmm. this has just really sharpened it and made it more acute. And schools, I think, are in a more desperate place because of it and more willing to admit the desperation. What I think we haven't done a good enough job of and what we probably still need to learn is what are the various interests of the people who could come together to really make change. So whether it's schools or synagogues or federations, like who are the potential partners in catalyzing change? Um, but I think we would be better off doing that, having some of those conversations now as opposed to waiting for schools to you know, sort of fizzle and die, which is really what's ha what has been happening in Los Angeles already. And I would assume outside of the Orthodox world and even in the Orthodox world will continue to happen. I think, Thank you. I think Sarah said that like spot on with, and I would add to that, that I feel the collaboration sometimes is going to have to go beyond cities. Like somehow there needs to be a forum to share what people have tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and and maybe even test new models. And I think that's the space where funders can help out if there's a promising model. Um, but it, I, I feel that we're very siloed um, in terms of the ability to really share uh, what's happening and what's not working, what is working across borders and regions maybe. I mean, and I would say like, we're so stuck in our region and even in our sort of national view of this. So like there's really interesting things going on in places like Toronto that I think could be applicable to some of the challenges we're facing here. And we're very quick to say, well, that Jewish community is different. Like that would never work here. Or if you look at the way like Australia funds its Jewish schools, like there are models that are more successful than what's going on. And maybe this is the opportunity to like let down some of the defenses and just say, we, we could actually learn from that. It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but let's test it out. And I think funders could be really helpful in that. Sarah, I want to ask one more question to you, and then I actually want to uh, ask a question to all of the funders on the call. So to you, Sarah, what do you see as the potential, the potential emotional and mental health impact on your school community? What are you seeing now, and what do you see potentially coming down the pike? So I'm going to give a silver lining to this first. And, you know, I think that it's been really important through all of this to look at the good that has come out of it because there's so much darkness. But one of the good pieces, I think, around sort of the mental health and emotional impact is the significant slowing down of the um, pressures associated with being both in a day school world and an independent school world altogether. 
And that's true for young parents. I mean, I'm a young parent, I'm a parent of young kids myself, but also true for high school age kids. So the not having every weekend spent with getting to baseball practice, getting to the, you know, the, the birthday party, then the next birthday party, making sure that the child has the violin tutor before the orchestra practice. And I'm as guilty of that as anybody. And in a high school context, not having the SAT tutor four times a week, and then the physics tutor to make sure that the child gets the A and to make sure that they're on the soccer team and part of the student government. The total pause on all of the craziness that I think Denise Pope and other researchers have pointed out is really not in the best interests of the emotional well-being of kids, I think is actually a big silver lining to all of this. The increased time spent with families, boredom. I think boredom's amazing educationally. So I think there's been a lot of good. I think that on the negative side, you know, the, there, there's no question that this is going to begin to touch everyone's lives. So when I did, I've been doing faculty check-ins, Zoom calls with faculty members one-on-one. -on -one, and in the first week of that, everyone was fine and their families were fine. By week two, everyone knew someone in the hospital. And by week three, grandparents, cousins, and aunts, they had already lost them. So I think that that will begin to take a toll in and of itself. And then I just think the anxiety that parents are feeling about the uncertainty of things that once felt certain, like the finan their finances and their ability to have jobs and pay for college. That I do think, I think kids are very um, attuned to the anxiety of adults and sort of the society around them. And that will have it, that will take a toll as well. Thanks, Sarah, for articulating that for all of us. Um, I want to actually invite all the funders on the call. If you are not a panelist, um, you are more than welcome to jump in. What do you wish you better understood in order to support schools at this moment? What do you wish you better understood that we might be able to help with right now? So in order to unmute your mic, go ahead and hover on the bottom left side of your screen and unmute and jump in or drop a message into the chat box. What do you wish you better understood in order to support schools at this moment in history? Um, two questions. One is, um, what are some of the creative models that um, some of you sort of alluded to um, that would be good for us to understand. And thinking about um, this present moment, if we were to help support our local day schools, um, what's the best way to do it? Um, is it to just give them funding and say, do what you know you need to do for your school? Is it to say, we know that you're really struggling um, you know with financial aid uh, you know for families and so we want to create a financial aid fund uh, tuition incentive what's the what's the best way um, to help support our schools in this time thank you for that question Dan Perla would you like to jump in on that the question is um, about successful models we're seeing all around and the best way to fund at this time um, every community is different, uh, and so it works in another. Having said that, um, we've always intrigued, been intrigued by some of these communal middle income programs in communities like Montreal and Metro West, where schools have the flexibility within a uh, broadly outlined financial program to provide middle income families and lower income families with scholarship and some or all of that scholarship is funded by foundations or federations um, and those have been effective at stabilizing enrollment and certainly in providing greater affordability in those communities so that's that's one um, uh, number two there are communities that we're getting calls from that are looking at this very question and uh, they're looking for comparable communities around them, uh, communities that look like them, uh, to see what those communities are doing. So my first suggestion would be, first, look at other comparable communities, look at communities that look like yours and see what they've tried that's worked and what hasn't worked. 
Um, but in particular, um, we've been very intrigued by these alternative tuition models and have been advocates of that for some time. Uh, I'm always happy to work with schools or communities that are interested in exploring this. So, you know, please, uh, please call. Uh, the other comment I'll make is, I think in terms of the what can we do now, you need to distinguish between short-term liquidity needs, meaning the field does need infusion uh, for all the reasons we've discussed to get them through the next few months and certainly and through the summer. Um, and uh, my personal view would be whatever you're comfortable doing as a funder in that regard, do it with as few restrictions as possible. But longer term, I think you need to look really closely at other community models, at these middle income programs, at what communities like you that resemble yours are doing uh, before you make any larger long-term commitments. Thanks, Dan. Paul Thank you. Bernstein. Sure. Paul Bergstein, do you want to jump in on this one as well? I know that you've had uh, a lot of exposure to these models. I, I'm happy to. I'm Paul Bernstein, the CEO of uh, Prisma, and thank you to to each of the speakers. I, I, just to add a little bit to, uh, to what Dan and, and some of the previous comments were touching on. Firstly, the the differences between individual schools, let alone individual communities. So especially when we're thinking about the short term, having insight and empathy for whatever the schools and their communities are facing right now is important and will be different. I think there was a comment earlier on from our colleague from Hafter, and I apologize, I'm not referring to you by name. I can't see who's behind that around. You know, there, there is a reality that some schools are better financially right now. Some schools will be struggling with a variety of different issues, for example, families that may be struggling to pay even in the short term. So the, the first thing I would say on the short term question is really understand the needs of the school or the schools that you're connected with, which might be everything from financial issues, or it might be to touch on some of the points that have been made about social and emotional questions. And one of the things that I've enjoyed one of the things I've enjoyed seeing over the last few weeks is the intense conversations going on between heads of schools and others through the Prisma network. And one of the most beautiful points that I saw suggested by one school was when their board had simply sent a small gift of a, a gift card or something to members of staff and to faculty as a way of appreciating the, what, what all of the staff have given to the school right now and also the social and emotional and family experiences that all of them have had. That's a small thing, but actually sometimes those small things can be intensely powerful in the life of a school. So I would think both, the, both in that level and also then at some of these more strategic and potentially long-term issues that we're also, uh, that we're also discussing. And where, as, as, again, as, as Dan has said, that ability to learn from each other is very powerful. And if anyone's interested to sort of to hear more about more here offline about what we're learning as time goes on from the conversations between schools and from schools, we'd be happy to do that. Um, so we'll add that to question of models, models that you know of going on in your communities or beyond that are successful right now. If our goal really is collaboration, what, um, what are you seeing that's working in your communities? I would just say, um, Deborah, I, you know, I don't know if I can answer definitively what's working or not working yet because it's so early on. But I think what is definitely working, but sort of process wise, is increased conversation and experimentation as a, a Los Angeles network, as a national network of Jewish day schools and independent schools overall. I think that there is a lot more conversation and a lot more sort of putting out ideas that would have never even been on the table. Like for instance, you know, do we all need to have the same kind, this, do we all need to hire elective teachers or high level academic teachers that service a very small population at a very high salary? Couldn't we share some of those resources citywide? I'm talking about high schools at this point. Or do we need three non-Orthodox middle schools in the city? Like the, when we really could combine and save a lot of overhead costs that exist right now and be sort of more efficient and effective and high quality in the model that we offered. None of those things have necessarily moved forward, you know, substantially in order to say, oh yes, this is working, but it's, we've been exploring them. Or on the tuition ends, 
we talked about just postponing the May deadline. And so many of our schools have decided to do that. I, I don't know if it's worked yet because it's a little early to say, but there is so much more sort of collaboration and willingness to take risks in ways that there just have, hasn't been before. Yeah, I think that's right, um, Sarah, that the, uh, especially the very last thing that you just said about the willingness to take risks, yeah. right? When the entire world is in it together with you, there is a new openness to creativity, to trying things differently, and the reality um, that really we're all in this together. Wendy, do you want to comment on any of those points? I, um, no, I don't really have much to add. I think it was, I, I think it's pretty much been set. Beautiful. Um, okay, folks, let me open up to the crowd. Any general questions for our panelists? for Dan Perla from Prisma, for uh, Sarah Shulkind from Milken Community Schools, and from Wendy New for Wendy Newberger from Crown Family Philanthropies. Any questions for them? Outside of collaboration, this question just came to me privately, what will we gain, do you think, from this experience? In terms of networks, in terms of learning curves, in terms of um, and any other pieces out in addition to the collaboration? What do you think we'll, we'll walk away from this experience differently? Sarah, can we start with you? Oh, Wendy, you ready? Go ahead. Sound like collaboration, but I'd like to switch it a little bit to like um, interdependence isn't such a great word, but an interlocking. Um, um, where this is uh, becomes um, institutionalized, that this collaboration isn't just a moment in time for problem solving, but rather that we figure out new systems of sharing, whether it's the educational piece, the social emotional piece, or certainly the financial modeling, that it becomes more systemic and um, pervasive. Sarah, do you want to jump in on that? So I would say one of the things that we're talking about is, you know, when this all is over or when things like return to normal, how will education look different? Because we've just gone through sort of a forced experiment educationally, and there's a lot about it that I think is really working. And so one of the things that we've been talking a lot about, and this is very educational, you know, specific to education, but the idea of assessment and how do we know what kids know and what's sort of the most essential concepts and understandings in a course and how do you sort of reshift focus to that, given that we've just been through this grand experiment of really having to sort of take an entire semester and narrow it down into a much shorter time frame online? I think the other question that comes out of that is like, what needs to be in person and or virtually in person, and what can be done on, what can a student do on their own, and how some of what we've traditionally done in education is done the things in the classroom that kids could actually be doing on their own. And what they can't do on their own is sort of the social interaction and the building of meaning or understanding together. So I think it's helping us to ask some really important questions educationally. Um, and then I think that there's possibility for national and global um, communication and learning for kids. So what we're doing on a classroom level, we could do with Jewish day schools across the country or internationally. And we've seen that it's not that hard to make it work. So I think, it's, it asks, I think that the last couple of months have made us ask a lot of really interesting questions about what education looks like going forward. And Sarah, one last question for you in our last minute together. What do you think is needed in supporting your team for professional development to sustain this online teaching and learning? Right after the initial excitement has worn off, do you feel like the teachers are equipped to figure this out in the long term or what kind of support would you like? Well, I mean, again, I think it's, it's sort of an experience of, um, it's, it's been very freeing in a lot of ways, because I think when you're an educator, you're sort of expected to know. And this has sort of put us all onto level playing, you know, onto a level playing field where nobody knows. It's new for everybody. And I think it's really free teachers to try something, say it didn't work, and try something else. So in a lot of ways, I see it as a really good thing. Um, there are lots of places that have been doing online learning or virtual learning really successfully and they've been running webinars and sort of been the, the, like the content area expert experts in helping schools to think it through but 
I think that the best piece about this, and I think what we could encourage even once this is all over, is the sense of sort of experimentation and also, you know, the, the need to rely on kids to give feedback in a real time way um, and to offer solutions to challenges that we as adults don't know how to fix. So, you know, that's like the silver lining to all of this is we talk about that all the time in education. And it's very, very hard to make happen in a classroom where you're isolated, where, you know, you've been doing the same thing for 30 years. This, no one's ever done it. So I think actually it, it's been a really interesting time for educators. And I've heard that feedback from many of our teachers. Sarah, thank you. Dr. Sarah Shulkin, Wendy Newberger, Dan Perla, thank you to the three of you for your generosity of spirit in joining us today and um, sharing your wisdom with us.